Welcome to Roundtable. I'm David Foster. We all know by now what a bad virus can do. But were you aware that without viruses, there would be no life on Earth? Say hello to the good viruses. Since humans first existed, viruses have caused havoc, killing millions. Since the COVID-19 crisis began, you may have thought, I wish we could get rid of them all. Yet those inside you right now are keeping you alive. Viruses have traditionally been seen as mankind's enemies, causing disease and often mutating to defeat our medicines. They have taken untold lives, sometimes millions at a time. From the 1918 influenza epidemic, which killed 50 to 100 million people, to the estimated 200 million who died from smallpox in the 20th century alone. The current COVID-19 pandemic is just one in a series of ongoing and never-ending deadly viral assaults. But scientists also want to use viruses for good. There have been significant advances in deploying viruses to fight a range of more complex, non-infectious diseases such as cancer. Experts are working to expand the number of conditions which can be effectively treated using virus-based approaches. What scientists know for sure is that without viruses, life on the planet as we know it would cease to exist. But how important could they be in keeping more of us healthy for longer? Very pleased to say that joining me on Roundtable, we have Paul Turner, an American evolutionary biologist and virologist at Yale University. We say hello to Marilyn Rusink, virus ecologist at the Center for Infectious Disease Dynamics, Penn State University. And John Bell is with us, two senior scientists at Ottawa Hospital Research Institute, who aims to use viruses to kill cancer cells. Thank you, each and every one of you, for being with us. Uh, Paul, may I come to you first of all? If there were no viruses on Earth, would there be anything on Earth? Well, I guess I would be concerned if there were absolutely no viruses on Earth. Uh, it's a reminder to your audience that viruses are the most plentiful thing on the planet. So they, in many ways, must be integral to the functioning of the planet. Uh, most people recognize viruses as parasites, but they serve as mutualists. So they're beneficially interacting with lots of species in natural communities, helping with the natural functioning of ecosystem properties, as they're called. So uh, I, I think I would actually be worried if there were no viruses on the planet. They do belong here, and they're part of uh, everyday natural functioning properly of our ecosystems. Well, perhaps if they weren't here, then you or I wouldn't be here to worry about it in any case. But 380 trillion, I read inside me, perhaps inside you, perhaps inside each and every one of you. Tell me about the good that they can do. So the, the numbers of viruses on the planet, that's just a staggering number within individuals, you know, uh, host organisms like us, both the good and the bad viruses that we carry around with us all the time. I'll just give you one brief example in a natural community, the way that they can function to help all of the earth. And this is what you call uh, geomicrobiology in the ocean. When you consider the vast number of viruses that thrive there and that are attacking and infecting and killing bacterial cells just through natural interactions between bacteria and these viruses in the oceans, essentially what this does is liberate carbon. It uh, allows certain chemical properties on the planet to be shunted through natural chemical systems and reactions so that ecosystems can function properly. So I think many people undervalue just how important viruses are to the ecosystem functioning on the planet. Extraordinary. Uh, Marilyn, let me come to you. I think one of your areas of research is into viruses and plants. You wrote a book called uh, viruses and in illustrated guy because you said you'd fallen in love with them. Why? <laughs> They're so cool. Um, I actually met my first virus, which was a bacteriophage, when I was an undergraduate. And essentially, it made me tear up all my plans for the future and reset to become a virologist. I, they're just so amazingly interesting and such small things with sometimes only one or two genes, and they can have huge dramatic effects on their host. 
But I, I want to add something to what Paul said, too. If we were to eliminate all the viruses right now, you would lose a significant portion of your genome because we are actually made from viruses. And so, these are the um, ones called uh, viromes that are part of in what make us who we are. No, those are actually in integrated into our genomes are many, many viruses that serve, many of them serve functions. For example, the placenta is um, there. We have a placenta because of an integrated retrovirus in our genome. So um, they serve essential functions in, as being part of our genome. The virome is not, are not viruses that are integrated. These are viruses that are living within us or in our bacteria. Okay, well, which brings me to, to, to John, if your area of expertise is cancer, are you looking at these things called bacteriophages, uh, which are viruses that can get into bacteria um, and, and destroy them? Is that one of the things that you're using with your cancer research? Well, I'm not doing that. One of my colleagues here is actually using bacteriophages as a, as a therapeutic to try to kill off antibiotic-resistant bacteria that might infect a prosthetic uh, limb, for instance, and often that interface between the limb and the person becomes infected with bacteria, which you can't treat with antibiotics. And so another strategy is to use a virus as a therapeutic to infect and kill those bacteria. My area is more about using viruses uh, to infect cancer cells, which are part of our body, and, and use those as therapeutics. How would you do that? So it's actually not that difficult. I mean, uh, viruses have a lot of really interesting properties. As you probably know, uh, viruses have been some of the most effective therapeutics in the human population. It used to be that the world was plagued by smallpox and that we used a, a virus-based vaccine to eliminate smallpox from the planet by creating a vaccine-type effect. In the cancer therapy, what we're using is we're using that, that same principle to try to arouse a cancer patient's immune system to recognize their cancer as foreign and then mount uh, really a personalized immune response against their own tumor and eliminate it. So that's one of the ways we use viruses really is to trigger or ignite an immune response within the cancer patient so that they make a very selective immune response against their own cancer and help to eliminate it. And this would um, negate the need for perhaps chemotherapy? Well, that's, that is certainly the dream. We, we are working hard towards that. Aside from using them as vaccines against cancer, we're using them as sort of called gene therapy vectors, where we encode in the virus uh, certain kinds of cancer uh, medicine producing genes. And so the real dream is that these viruses will move out of your body and the only place they can grow is inside the tumor itself and deposit and create, turn the tumor into a, actually a factory uh, to make uh, anti-cancer therapeutics. And because it's so selective and because it happens only in the cancer, we, we can help to eliminate the side effects that you mentioned that happen with chemotherapy and radiation therapy because the only place the therapeutics active is within the tumor itself. Is it working? For sure. There, there's been one virus already that's been approved by the FDA and by the uh, EMEA in Europe. Uh, and in Britain to be used in melanoma treatment. So this is a virus which is very selectively grows uh, in melanoma uh, and helps to kill it, helps to stimulate the patient's immune system to recognize that the cancer is foreign. Uh, and now there's a, a, a tremendous amount of activity around the planet to make new versions of these kinds of viruses. We like to refer to them basically as, as uh, therapeutic battleships that we arm in many different ways and they can float throughout the body looking for cancers, infecting them and attacking them directly. So this is really a burgeoning area, I think, that's going to be really exciting in the, in the, in the next uh, few years and decades to come. I'll come back to you in a moment because I've got a number of questions. But Marilyn, I want to come to you. As I mentioned plants as being one of your areas of expertise when it comes to virus. In what sense? Because plants obviously provide us with the majority of food on, on this planet. Could that help sustain populations? Well, there's two aspects of that. So we do know of beneficial viruses in plants. We recently um, did a study on viruses that are in uh, jalapeno peppers, and they deter aphids. So aphids are a big problem for plants. For one thing, they carry pathogenic viruses, but they also do a lot of damage to plants. So when, these, when plants have this virus, they, the aphids are not interested in the plants. They prefer plants without the virus. So this is a beneficial virus to the plants. Um, but they also do cause disease in plants. And so that is a significant concern for 
the for the planet because plant virus disease is probably equally important to human virus disease in terms of yeah if we lose our plants we lose our food supply um, so there are um, tons of viruses in plants and most of them have not been studied that well so there are lots and lots of these viruses that are like the one I described in jalapeno they actually live in their host for essentially as long as we know of they are passed from through the seeds from one generation to the next they're very, very common. We're eating them every day because we, they're in most of the plants we eat. Um, and we think that those have probably a number of beneficial functions in the plants, but they haven't been studied as much. You know, humans have been preoccupied with pathogens. I, and I, understandably right now in the midst of this pandemic, um, but on the other hand, um, most viruses are not pathogens. So we really need to have the funding and the ability to look at these ones that are not pathogens as well. Well, that, that was where you, you answered a question I was about to put to you. We, we, we've made a mistake. Let me go on to Paul, if I may, with this one. Uh, we've made a mistake as mankind, haven't we, in not concentrating on these good viruses? This is true. So if I could follow up on some of the comments that uh, John provided. Uh, you know, there's a way of taking viruses that are attacking our cancer cells, that are attacking bacteria that would infect the human body, and you rely on uh, basically the enemy of my enemy is my friend, kind of a, an approach. So as he mentioned with his colleague, my group also studies phage therapy. So this is the discovery and use of naturally occurring viruses that are specific only to bacteria. So these are called the bacteriophages. And what we found is that there's a dizzying variety of them that have yet to be discovered. And some of them are better than our antibiotics in killing target bacteria, which is very good news. David Pride, who's the Associate Director of Microbiology at the University of California, San Diego. I believe that harnessing the power of bacteria as ultimate natural predators will teach us how to prevent and combat bacterial infections. And you've answered that to some extent, but I have two points from that. Why are they a natural predator and how do you harness that power? Well, if you consider uh, bacteria are the first cellular organisms to be uh, on the planet some three to four billion years ago, and we don't know for sure, but it's very likely that these viruses that are specific to killing them arose around the same time period. So for literally billions of years on this planet, there's been war waged between bacteria and bacteriophages. Now, in some circumstances, these are positive interactions between these microbes, but in many cases, these viruses are killing bacterial cells in order to replicate. So how one accomplishes uh, using this for human applications is this is very old technology. The Russians first developed it. Uh, people discovered it. Non-Russian scientists dis first discovered phages long before we discovered antibiotics. So the idea is that you take these phages and you put them into a host organism that's suffering with a bacterial infection and you use this instead of a drug. And as John alluded to, the beauty of harnessing viruses this way is that they're self-amplifying drugs. They get inside of cells, they make copies uh, of themselves using the, the cells you know, to do this. And as a result, you can get a drug that amplifies, which antibiotics won't do that. Other drugs that are chemical-based won't do that. And this could be highly, highly efficient. I don't know who wants to answer this question, uh, perhaps first hand up. It, it, it is. It occurs to me that COVID-19 and other pathogenic viruses are perhaps the idiot viruses because they destroy their hosts and have to move on to something else. And if they destroyed everything there was, they would no longer have a place to live. The brighter ones are perhaps these good viruses we're talking about. How daft is it for me to suggest something like that? Uh, I'll, I can answer that. Um... So actually, you're probably right. Well, I don't know that I would say they're so stupid is that they just haven't adapted to us. So a virus that's mutualistic, usually we find they've been hanging out with their hosts for a long, long time. So the hosts and the viruses have adapted to each other. And you're absolutely right. A virus that kills its host is not going to go on for too long, especially if it kills all its hosts. And even if it makes its host very sick, for example, if you have the flu, bad enough to stay home in bed, then you're not running around the community spreading it around and letting other people get infected. So in general, it's not a good idea for a virus to make its host too sick. There's a whole field of study in this area called the evolution of virulence. Um, 
So we're learning a lot about that. Uh, I would say some of the best studies in recent times on this have been done with fish viruses. They were just a really good model to look at this, and they've been doing studies in actually in wild fish, too, in nature. So you're right. It's absolutely true. A virus does not really want to kill its host. I think the only motivation a virus has, if you want to call it that, is to replicate, to reproduce itself. That's what it's there for. And if it makes its host happier, then it's probably going to have a nice, cushy place to hang out. Could we possibly, I'll stay with you with the, for this one, Marilyn, or, or Paul, and then I'll come back to you, uh, John, with some more questions about the work you're doing. Would it be possible to harness the power of viruses to kill other viruses? Um, in some sense, that may be tr possible. For example, viruses that elicit an immune response um, are certainly going to affect other viruses that might be coming along into that host. And then there is also um, recent studies have shown that our gut bacteria release a lot of bacteriophage. Some of those hang out in the mucous membranes, which, is a, which are really the entry points to the body. And then they may impact either other virus or other bacterial infections. So kind of acting like a natural immune um, response that would affect both bacteria and viruses. And there are certainly lots and lots of studies of viruses interfering with each other, which is basically called virus interference, oddly enough. And they also can enhance each other, which is the negative side of that. Um, so they definitely interact a lot. Uh, no one has, to my knowledge, Paul might know more about this. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of anybody actually doing this kind of work, um, trying to use viruses to combat other viruses, but that may be going on. Okay, Paul, answer that one if you would, and then, then sorry to leave you on the sidelines for a moment, John, but I've got a few questions for you as well. Um, could we harness them as weaponize them, if you like, against other viruses? Yeah, I, I can think of at least two ways. One, it's already traditionally done. Sometimes in developing a vaccine, we'll take a virus into the laboratory and essentially grow it on cells that are uh, training the virus, if you will, to grow on those cell types and to become worse at growing on some other cell types, such as human cells. So in this way, you can more effectively put that strain of a virus into the human body, mount an immune response, and it would protect you against the more pathogenic form of the virus or a closely related virus. A little more um, skeptical in the, about the, the extent to which we have the firm data for it, but there are certainly mouse studies that show that some uh, viruses infect those host organisms and will protect against infection against other viruses. So that, that would mean in the human body, you could already have viruses within your genome that are protecting you against infection, against closely related viruses. And that's a very, very difficult thing to prove as well as difficult to study, but it's certainly plausible because it's been shown to occur in other mammals. And we may get to understand it a bit more in, in the future, which leads me, John, to ask you, not specifically about cancer, but if you look into a crystal ball, could you ever see a time um, when we could create viruses that we took into ourselves um, and they were able to identify a host of different problems that we have and effectively keep us illness free? I, I think that's very possible, actually, to use them as machines, uh, biological machines, to uh, have various ways to sense uh, diseases or perhaps act as sentinels. You know, you think of the sort of science fiction movies. There's one um, many decades ago that you may remember with Raquel Welch, and she was put into a submarine. They shrunk it down and then injected it into the body, and it went around and looked for disease. And I think, you know, that was an interesting concept for a, a science fiction movie, but I think it's also possible uh, to create these biological therapies to, to be able to go around and patrol and look for malignancies, look for infected cells is another way we could, uh, one of the things that, that plagues humans is we get these so-called chronic infections like hepatitis infections. And so it's, and people are working on the concept of using the viruses to infect and kill chronically infected cells and eliminate that infection. So I think there's lots of ways we could do this. We need to, uh, I would just echo what Marilyn said earlier about the importance of investing in this kind of research, this fundamental biology so that we can really take advantage of what we're learning and create a world where we have uh, many, many tools like this to address some of the issues we face and, you know, rapidly eliminate diseases like we're experiencing right now with the COVID pandemic. I think this is all within our grasp. 
We just have to uh, take advantage of the knowledge we have and build on that knowledge. So let me come back to a question I put to the others. Yeah, yeah, Marin, please ignore me. That's um, the best I, policy. I should. <laughs> That's right. I should have mentioned about cross protection in plants. So this has been actually going on in plants with plant viruses for a long time. So you find a mild strain, infect all the plants with it, and then it, they're resistant to the more severe strain. And actually, right now, it, that's a very important strategy in in a cacao because the cacao in in uh, Africa is really suffering from a serious disease caused by a virus called cacao swell and shoot disease. And um, that's exactly how they're they've been managing it for years and years is by infecting those plants with mild strains of the virus. So yeah, that is something that we have done in plants for quite a while. Extraordinary. Um, John, back with you. Have we got it totally wrong in pushing all our attention onto the path pathogens, uh, those viruses that can kill or certainly seriously hurt, rather than looking at those that can save? And what's it going to take to change that if that's the case? Well, you know, you, you focus on the on the bad things because, of course, of what's happening in the world today, and, and or or other. I mean, there's viruses which we know can cause cancers, as an example. That's another one uh, that is a concern. And of course, those are the things. It's the squeaky wheel phenomena. But I think, you know, as Marilyn suggested and Paul suggested, you know, there's there's fundamental knowledge about how these uh, parasites interact with us. Uh, that if we understood better, we could definitely uh, use that knowledge to create new kinds of therapeutics, for instance. What do you reckon? Were viruses here before us? Or, I mean, before life as we know it, not necessarily humans. Were they here before us or because they need us? Or were they, or did they come after us? And if so, why? Paul? That's a very intriguing question. The origin of viruses, this is quite murky territory. It's very difficult to know this for sure. Many have speculated uh, that there was an RNA world and following the RNA world, there was a virus world, and then cells evolved. Whereas others would believe that cellular life had to predate viruses explicitly, and that all viruses followed after then. So these are actually, I think, not necessarily mutually exclusive um, explanations. So we have a very poor understanding, I think, of the rate at which new viruses truly evolve on the planet. I'm not talking about those that are existing in a reservoir species and then jumping into a host like humans, we're talking about how did they even enter that reservoir species in the first place. So I think this is fascinating for scientists to grapple with. I don't believe that there are very firm data on it, but certainly they are just such an integral part of our biosphere at this point that it's, uh, it's not surprising that they are extremely successful. We live in a world that's pretty much dominated by parasitic lifestyles, and viruses are kind of the kingpins of using cellular life to replicate. And then it gets somewhat confusing. Some of them are parasitic, some of them are mutualists, and some of them really have no effect on their hosts at all. So we really have a lot to learn about the vastness of virus biodiversity on the planet. Who wants to answer this one or speculate? If they did come before us, and then they came to Earth and they needed a host and we became that host, could they have come from somewhere else, somewhere out there? <laughs> Hard to say. I, I guess it's possible. Um, I do. I am kind of of the camp that thinks that viruses came before cellular life, but uh, I think they, I do not really think they came from outer space, although I certainly wouldn't rule it out. Um, I think that that's how life evolved on Earth. That's my opinion. But without a time machine, I guess we're not going to know. It's very hard to know for sure. Extraordinary. John, let me ask you. I mean, you must be so excited about what you're able to do with cancer patients. And you mentioned your colleague earlier who was talking about prosthetic limbs. Is this the future of medicine, using good viruses? I think I think it can definitely be. I think it certainly could be the future uh, of cancer therapy. We know, we, as you know, we have radiation therapy. We have chemotherapy, we have surgery. Uh, I, I like to think of viruses as, as, as that next pillar of, of uh, cancer treatment. Uh, it's, a, it's a way to strategically and thoughtfully uh, attack cancer. Right now, the problem with chemotherapy, as everyone knows, is that the chemotherapy not only attacks the cancer, but it also attacks your normal tissues. And that's why we see the side effects. That's why we have to stop treating patients. And so I think with a thoughtful approach, uh, using the knowledge that we're gaining uh, to create therapeutics that are smart, 
and actually only do what they're supposed to do, which is attack the cancer, I think that is, is certainly within our grasp now, uh, as it has never been before. And I think with the right kinds of support to do this, I think we're going to see these changes in, in, in not only cancer therapy, but many other kinds of diseases as well. Gene therapy, another one I mentioned earlier, where we have these rare diseases that people suffer from, uh, where they have a genetic defect and they be life-ending disease. And now we're seeing some of those people be cured of their disease by the insertion of that gene back into their genetic information using a virus vector. So I think there's lots that we need to understand and learn and exploit these therapeutics to really change how we treat diseases. I thank you very, very much indeed for coming on this edition of Roundtable. I've learned a lot, and I hope that anybody who's watching this program has come away as fascinated as I am. Uh, for me, David Foster from the Roundtable team, we hope to have your company next time. Until then, goodbye.